While his timely mobilization may have saved the 140 Indians' lives, the sage's actions drained his political capital among whites, especially on the frontier. Such actions made myself many enemies among the populace, Franklin wrote. What Franklin called the whole weight of the proprietary interest joined against him to get me out of the assembly, which was accordingly effected in the last election. Franklin was sent off to England during early November 1764, being accompanied to the ship, 16 miles, by a cavalcade of 300 of my friends, who filled our sails with their good wishes. A month later, Franklin began work as Pennsylvania's agent to the Crown. The rest of the decade was a time of instability on the frontier. Franklin was in frequent correspondence with his son, William Franklin, and with William Johnson, who kept the elder Franklin posted on problems they encountered with squatters. Johnson wrote to Franklin July 10, 1766. I daily dread a rupture with the Indians occasioned by the licentious conduct of the frontier inhabitants who continue to rob and murder them. William wrote to his father three days later, There have been lately several murders of Indians in the different provinces. Those committed in this province will be duly inquired into, and the murderers executed, as soon as found guilty. They are all apprehended and secured in jail. For the rest of his life, shuttling between America, England, and France on various diplomatic assignments, Franklin continued to develop his philosophy with abundant references to the Indian societies he had observed so closely during his days as envoy to the Six Nations. Franklin's combination of indigenous American thought and European heritage earned him the title among his contemporaries as America's first philosopher. In Europe, he was sometimes called the philosopher as savage. 1. Franklin could not help but admire the proud, simple life of America's native inhabitants, wrote Connor in Poor Richard's Politics, 1965. There was a noble quality in the stories, which he told of their hospitality and tolerance, of their oratory and pride. Franklin, said Connor, saw an Indian's conduct, a living symbol of simplicity and happy mediocrity, exemplifying essential aspects of the virtuous order. Depiction of this healthful, primitive morality could be instructive for transplanted Englishmen, still doting on foreign gigas, happiness, Franklin wrote, is more generally and equally diffused among savages than in our civilized societies. Happy mediocrity meant striking a compromise between the over-civilization of Europe, with its distinctions between rich and poor and consequent corruption, and the egalitarian, democratic societies of the Indians that formed a counterpoint to European monarchy. The virtuous order would combine both, borrowing from Europe arts, sciences, and mechanical skills, taking from the Indians aspects of the natural society that Franklin and others believed to be a window on the pasts of other cultures, including those from which the colonists had come. There is in the writings of Franklin, as well as those of Jefferson, a sense of using the Indian example to recapture natural rights that Europeans had lost under monarchy. The European experience was not to be reconstructed on American soil. Instead, Franklin, as well as Jefferson, sought to erect an amalgam, a combination of indigenous American Indian practices and the cultural heritage that the new Americans had carried from Europe. In discussing the new culture, Franklin and others drew from experience with Native Americans, which was more extensive than that of the European natural rights philosophers. The American Indian's theory and practice affected Franklin's observations on the need for appreciation of diverse cultures and religions, public opinion as the basis for a polity, the nature of liberty and happiness, and the social role of property. American Indians also appear frequently in some of Franklin's scientific writings. At a time much less specialized than the 20th century, Franklin and his associates, such as Colden and Jefferson, did not think it odd to cross from philosophy to natural science to practical politics. Franklin's writings on American Indians were remarkably free of ethnocentrism, although he often used words such as savages, which carry more prejudicial connotations in the 20th century than in his time. Franklin's cultural relativism was perhaps one of the purest expressions of Enlightenment assumptions that stressed racial equality and the universality of moral sense among peoples. Systematic racism was not called into service until a rapidly expanding frontier demanded that enemies be dehumanized during the rapid, historically inevitable westward movement of the 19th century. Franklin's respect for cultural diversity did not reappear widely as an assumption in Euro-American thought until Franz Boas and others revived it around the end of the 19th century. Franklin's writings on Indians expressed the fascination of the Enlightenment with nature, the natural origins of man and society, and natural, or human, rights. They are likewise imbued with a search, which amounted at times almost to a ransacking of the past, for alternatives to monarchy as a form of government, 
and to Orthodox state-recognized churches as a form of worship. Franklin's sense of cultural relativism often led him to see events from an Indian perspective, as when he advocated colonial union and regulation of the Indian trade at the behest of the Iroquois. His relativism was expressed clearly in the opening lines of an essay, Remarks Concerning the Savages of North America, which may have been written as early as the 1750s, following Franklin's first extensive personal contact with Indians, but was not published until 1784. Savages we call them, because their manners differ from ours, which we think the perfection of civility, they think the same of theirs. Perhaps, if we could examine the manners of different nations with impartiality, we should find no people so rude, as to be without any rules of politeness, nor any so polite, as not to have some remains of rudeness. In this essay, Franklin also observed that, education, must be measured against cultural practices and needs. Having few artificial wants, they Indians, have abundance of leisure for improvement by conversation. Our laborious manner of life, compared with theirs, they esteem slavish and base, and the learning, on which we value ourselves, they regard as frivolous and useless. Franklin illustrated this point by recounting an exchange between the commissioners of Virginia and the Iroquois at the 1744 Lancaster Treaty Council. The account of the treaty, written by Conrad Weiser, reported that the Virginia commissioners asked the Iroquois to send a few of their young men to a college in Williamsburg, probably William and Mary, where they would be well provided for, and instructed in the learning of the white people. The Iroquois took the matter under advisement for a day, to be polite, Franklin indicated, and answered the Virginia commissioners July 4, the same day that Canasatego advised the colonists to form a union. Canasatego answered for the Iroquois a few minutes after his advice regarding the union. We must let you know that we love our children too well to send them so great a way, and the Indians are not inclined to give their children learning. We allow it to be good, and thank you for your invitation, but our customs differing from yours, you will be so good as to excuse us. Franklin's essay was taken almost exactly from the 1744 treaty account published by his Philadelphia Press during that year. In the essay, Franklin related that Canasatego told the commissioners that his people had had experience with such proposals before. Several of our young people were formerly brought up at the colleges of the northern provinces, the sachem said. They were instructed in all your sciences, but when they came back to us, they were bad runners, ignorant of every means of living in the woods, unable to bear either cold or hunger. The young men educated in Euro-American schools were good for nothing, Canasatego asserted. In Franklin's account, Canasatego not only turned down the commissioner's offer with polite firmness, but made a counter-offer himself. If the gentlemen of Virginia will send us a dozen of their sons, we will take great care of their education, instruct them in all we know, and make men of them. Franklin's remarks concerning the savages shows an appreciation of the Indian councils, which he had written were superior in some ways to the British Parliament. Having frequent occasion to hold public councils, they have acquired great order and decency in conducting them. The women are the records of the council, who take exact notice of what passes and imprint it in their memories, to communicate it to their children. Franklin also showed appreciation of the sharpness of memory fostered by reliance on oral communication. They preserved traditions of stipulations in treaties 100 years back, which, when we compare with our writings, we always find exact. When a speaker at an Indian council, the reference was probably to the Iroquois, had completed his remarks, he was given a few minutes to recollect his thoughts, and to add anything that might have been forgotten. To interrupt another, even in common conversation, is reckoned highly indecent. How different this is to the conduct of a polite British House of Commons, where scarce a day passes without some confusion, that makes the speaker hoarse in calling to order. Indian customs in conversation were reflected in Poor Richard for 1753, the year of Franklin's first diplomatic assignment, to negotiate the Carlisle Treaty. A pair of good ears will drain dry a thousand tongues. Franklin also compared this Indian custom favorably with the mode of conversation of many polite companies of Europe, where, if you do not deliver your sentence with great rapidity, you are cut off in the middle of it by the impatient loquacity of those you converse with, and never suffered to finish it. Some white missionaries had been confused by Indians who listened to their sermons patiently, and then refused to believe them. Franklin wrote. To Franklin, the order and decorum of Indian councils were important to them because their government relied on public opinion. All their government is by counsel of the sages, there is no force, there are no prisons, no officers to compel obedience, or inflict punishment. Indian leaders study oratory, and the best speaker had the most influence, Franklin observed. In words that would be echoed by Jefferson, 
Franklin used the Indian model as an exemplar of government with a minimum of governance. This sort of democracy was governed not by fiat, but by public opinion and consensus creating custom. All of the Indians of North America not under the dominion of the Spaniards are in that natural state, being restrained by no laws, having no courts or ministers of justice, no suits, no prisons, no governors vested with any legal authority. The persuasion of men distinguished by reputation of wisdom is the only means by which others are governed or rather led and the state of the Indians was probably the first state of all nations. Franklin also compared the Indians' offers of free lodging and food for visitors to the customs of Euro-Americans. The Iroquois kept guesthouses for travelers. This custom was contrasted by Franklin with Indians' treatment in white towns. He recounted a conversation between Conrad Weiser and Canasatego, who were close friends. In that conversation, Canasatego said to Weiser, If a white man, in traveling throw, our country, enters one of our cabins, we treat him as I treat you. We dry him if he is wet, we warm him if he is cold, we give him meat and drink that he may allay his thirst and hunger, and we spread soft furs for him to rest and sleep on. We demand nothing in return. But, if I go to a white man's house in Albany, and ask for victuals and drink, they say, where is your money? And if I have none, they say, get out, you Indian dog. Franklin was also given to affecting Indian speech patterns in some of his writings, another indication that his respect for diverse cultures enhanced his understanding of the Indians with whom he often associated. In 1787, he described the American political system in distinctly Iroquoian terms to an unnamed Indian correspondent. I am sorry that the great council fire of our nation is not now burning, so that you cannot do your business there. In a few months, the coals will be racked out of the ashes and will again be kindled. Our wise men will then take the complaints of your nation into consideration and take the proper measures for giving you satisfaction. Franklin was also fond of calling on the great spirit when he could do so in appreciative company. Religious self-righteousness and pomposity was a favorite target of Franklin's pen and he often used Indians to illustrate the religious relativism that was basic to his own deistic faith. Deism, a religion that more than any other was prototypical of the Enlightenment frame of mind, emphasized naturalism, natural man, and rational inquiry, all of which finally complemented Franklin's interests in Indian cultures. Like Colden before him and Jefferson after him, Franklin often used his deist beliefs to stress the universality of moral sense among peoples and to break down ethnocentricity. Many of the people who were closest to the Indians during this period were Deists. Calling on the Great Spirit was not at all out of character for them. According to Alfred O. Aldridge, Benjamin Franklin and Nature's God, 1967, Deism involved belief in the superiority of natural religion, as opposed to the hollow formalism of Christianity. Deism formed an ideal complement to the natural rights philosophy that was so important in Enlightenment thought. According to Aldridge, Franklin's early articles of belief, 1728, showed that, early in his life, many of his religious beliefs resembled those of several American Indians. At that time, Franklin even accepted polytheism. Although he later acknowledged monotheism, Franklin never lost his critical eye toward conventional Christianity. Aldridge found in Franklin's remarks concerning the savages of North America an abundant satire of religious proselytizing and economic imperialism. In his Remarks Concerning the Savages, Franklin described a Swedish minister who lectured a group of Susquehanna Indians on the story of the creation, including, the fall of our first parents from eating an apple, the coming of Christ to repair the mischief, his miracles and suffering in sea. The Indians replied that it was, indeed, bad to eat apples, when they could have been made into cider. They then repaid the missionary's storytelling favor by telling him their own creation story. The missionary was aghast at this comparison of Christianity with what he regarded as heathenism and, according to Franklin, replied, What I deliver to you are sacred truths, but what you tell me is mere fable, fiction and falsehood. The Indians, in turn, told the missionary that he was lacking in manners. My brother, the Indians told the missionary, It seems that your friends have not done you justice in your education, that they have not well instructed you in the rules of common civility. You saw that we, who understand and practice those rules, believed all your stories. Why do you refuse to believe ours? In the same essay, Franklin commented on the use of religion as a cover for economic exploitation. Again he used Canasatego, in conversations related to Franklin by Weiser. According to Franklin, Canasatego asked Weiser, Conrad, 
you have lived long among the white people, and know something of their customs. I have sometimes been to Albany and noticed that once in seven days they shut up their shops and assemble in the great house, tell me, what is it for? Wiser was said by Franklin to have replied, they meet there to learn good things. Canasatego had no doubt that the town merchants were hearing good things in the church, but he doubted that all those good things were purely religious. He had recently visited Albany to trade beaver pelts for blankets, knives, powder, rum, and other things. He asked a merchant, Hans Hansen, about trading, and Hansen told the sachem that he couldn't talk business because it was time for the meeting to hear good things in the great house. After the merchants returned from the church, Canasatego found that all of them had fixed the price of beaver at three shillings sixpence a pound. This made it clear to me that my suspicion was right, and that whatever they pretended of meeting to learn good things, the real purpose was to consult how to cheat Indians in the price of beaver, the sachem said, according to Franklin's account. In Poor Richard for 1751, Franklin wrote, To Christians bad rude Indians we prefer, tis better not to know than knowing air. Unlike Franklin, many English deists had never seen an Indian, but they, too, often assumed that the American natives would have a religion akin to deism one based on the commonly observed phenomena of nature and dedicated to the worship of nature's god, Aldridge wrote. Franklin saw the similarity of his own faith to that of Indians confirmed through personal experience. Deists, like Franklin, who sought to return to the simplicity of nature, appeared to see things worth emulating in Indian societies. Franklin's use of Canasatego to twit conventional Christianity was not unique in his time. Satirists on both sides of the Atlantic used the testaments of real or fictitious Indians to deflate the righteousness of clerics. Did the Indians not have their own theories of the Earth's origin? Canasatego also figured importantly in an elaborate hoax intended to ridicule conventional Christianity, which appeared in the London Chronicle in June 1768. The hoax involved a review of a non-existent book, The Captivity of William Henry. The fake review was not signed, so it is not possible to prove that Franklin wrote it. Whoever did concoct the hoax knew quite a bit about Iroquois society and customs, which made Franklin an obvious candidate. The style of the hoax fits Franklin, but some rather obvious errors point away from Franklin's authorship. For example, William Henry was purportedly taken captive in 1755 when he met Canasatego, who, in point of fact, had died in 1750. Regardless of its authorship, the hoax illustrated the use that was made of Indians as a counterpoint to conventional Christianity at the time. Such publications tended to legitimatize religious pluralism, as they sought a middle ground between the corrupting over-civilization of Europe and the simplicity of the state of nature in which they believed that many Indians lived, Franklin and other deists paid abundant attention to the political organization of the Indians, especially the Iroquois, who were not only the best organized Indian polity with which British Americans had contact, but who were also allied with them. Franklin had the conception of an original, pre-political state of nature in which men were absolutely free and equal a condition he thought admirably illustrated among the American Indians, Isolin wrote in Franklin's Political Theories, 1928. Franklin himself wrote, their wants are supplied by the spontaneous productions of nature, and that they did not at all want to be civilized. This state of nature was eagerly sought by many 18th century Euro-Americans. To understand how many Europeans left their own cultures to live with the Indians is to realize just how permeable the frontier was. To those who remained behind, it was often rumored that those who had gone over to the Indians had been captured. While some captives were taken, more often the whites took up Indian life without compulsion. As Franklin wrote to Peter Collinson May 9, 1753, the proneness of human nature to a life of ease, of freedom from care and labor appears strongly in the heretofore little success that has attended every attempt to civilize our American Indians. They visit us frequently and see the advantages that arts, science and compact society procure us. They are not deficient in natural understanding and yet they have never strewn any inclination to change their manner of life for ours, or to learn any of our arts. While Indians did not seem to have much inclination to exchange their culture for the Euro-American, Many Euro-Americans appeared more than willing to become Indians at this time, 